We tell stories because we'd often prefer to live in fiction than face the horrors of reality. Myths are a type of story, and we often use them to make sense of what we can't make sense of or what we refuse to. Myths can protect us from the truth. As war is so horrific, it makes sense why we would dress it in myth. Falsehoods and exaggeration shroud both world wars, and no belligerent nation is totally free of them, not even Australia. In this video, we're going to shed light on some of the myths commonly associated with Australians in the First and Second World Wars. One prevailing myth regarding Aussies in World Wars is that they were, by and large, rugged, resourceful bushmen with exceptional tents. According to Michael John Pine's relationships between officers and other ranks in the Australian Army in the Second World War, this was a stereotype proliferated by the famous Aussie historian Charles Bean. In reality though, the majority of Australian men who served in wars came from the city and urban backgrounds. They were city slickers. As the Bushman stereotype was so prominent in stories from World War I, Aussie soldiers sent off to fight in the Second World War felt they had to live up to it when, really, the whole thing had been blown out of proportion. According to Pine, many of these men were living in the shadow of the Australian bush and pioneer legends which helped to form the identity of the Australians in World War I. Another aspect of Aussie soldiers that appears to have been blown out of proportion was their larrikinism. This term isn't super easy to pin down, but we define a larrikin as a troublemaker with a good heart. In a military context, the negative effects of larrikinism boiled down to a perceived lack of discipline. But were the Aussies truly lacking in this department? With this, it's very much the extent to which Australian soldiers lack discipline that is the myth. As there are, if we're being honest, bucket loads of examples of poor discipline to draw upon, especially from the First World War. For instance, the aforementioned historian Bean wrote the following in his diary. There was a great deal of drunkenness in Cairo, and I could not help noticing that what people said was true. The Australians were responsible for most of it. I think we have to admit that our force contains more bad hats than the others, and I think also that the average Australian is certainly a harder liver. He does do bad things, at least that the rest of the world considers as really bad. Here, Bean was agreeing with British General Sir Archibald Murray, who, reflecting on Australian soldiers' behaviour in Cairo, said, I have never seen a body of men in uniform with less idea of discipline. So that settles it, right? The Aussie diggers were just as undisciplined and uncontrollable as their reputation suggests. Well, maybe not. There's plenty of evidence of good discipline too, including what Bean wrote for the Australian War Memorial in 1983. It was discipline, firmly based on the national habit of facing facts and going straight for the objective, that was responsible for the Australian's astonishing success. This definitely contradicts what he wrote about the Aussies in Cairo, and while we chalk it up to being wanting to paint Australian soldiers in a more positive light later in life, others have made similar arguments, especially in the context of World War II. Hearing stories of Anzac larrikinism and mateship from their fathers and grandfathers who served in the First World War, the soldiers of World War II believed they would, in Pine's words, be led by an informal discipline rather than a formal military discipline. But this led to a sense of disappointment and bitterness when they did not find that the army lived up to these expectations. Instead of officers and men pulling together in the spirit of the Anzac legend, they found an army that was led by an officer class that was more elite than they had expected. When Pine said informal discipline, he was referring to a system dictated by mateship and mutual respect. A quote by World War I veteran Rog Burridge illustrates this point. We had good officers. We respected them. They were down-to-earth blokes, and just like mates. They treated us the same as themselves. They respected us, and we respected them. They all were working-class people, so they were okay. So, while the Aussies may have lacked discipline in a traditional military sense, they weren't wholly without it. They just had their own brand of it. If larrikinism was one side of a coin, fearlessness was the other. If we're to believe the stereotype, while the Aussie soldier may have lacked typical military discipline, his morale was always high and he feared nothing. Of course, this was far from true for every soldier. In Anzac memories, 
putting popular memory theory into practice in Australia, author Alistair Thompson states, the legend of the Australian soldier, the best fighter in the war, caused many diggers to repress their feelings during and after the war. Thompson goes on to quote Great War veteran Fred Farrell, who spoke of the trauma he suffered after returning home. I had dreams of being shelled and being frightened, scared stiff. You don't know when the next shell that is coming is going to blow you to pieces or leave you crippled. Farrell also explained that the digger stereotype, the larrikin and fearless fighter, did not fit his experience of the war and also made him feel uncomfortable about his own identity. For this reason, he avoided Anzac celebrations like the plague. In his book, We Were the Rats, Australian World War II veteran Jack Lawson Glassop suggests that Anzac legends from the First World War caused similar problems for Australians in World War II. In Glassop's words, the trouble is the world expects so much of us. They think we all swear like troopers, drink like fish, and fight like wildcats, and that we don't know the meaning of the word fit. We can blame our fathers. It makes it hard for us. All our lives, we've read that when our turn comes, we don't let everyone down. So, while these expectations may have rallied the Aussies as a collective, the individual soldier was still shaking in his boots. Returning to our definition of a larrikin, a troublemaker with a good heart, we can shed some light on another myth regarding Australian soldiers, that they were all, indeed, and always good-hearted people. Our point here is that Australian soldiers committed atrocities too. For one, they were not above killing surrendered Japanese in the Second World War, a notion supported by Australian historian Mark Johnston. In his words, it often proved difficult to prevent Australian soldiers from killing captured Japanese before they could be interrogated. Some Japanese soldiers were almost certainly deterred from surrendering to Australians. If General Sir Thomas Blamey is anything to go off, this behaviour was far from shunned by high command as well. In January 1943, interviewed by the New York Times, he said, We are not dealing with humans as we know them. Our troops have the right view of the Japs. They regard them as vermin. As for an example from World War I, there was a case of the Kiwi soldier, Leslie Lowry, who chased after a Bedouin man who'd robbed him near the village of Sarafan Alamar in what was then, in 1918, Palestine. Closing on the thief, the thief shot him, and with his dying words, Lowry told his Anzac brothers in arms what had happened. The Anzacs then took their revenge, an event which the famous Australian poet Banjo Patterson described like this. A few Australians went along with them. There couldn't be any trouble on any front without an Australian being in on it. And the revenge party followed the thief to his village, recovered the stolen goods, and killed every able-bodied man in the village. Then they threw the bodies down the well, filled the well up, and burnt the village. This wasn't troublemaking, this was an atrocity. So going off the evidence we discussed today, not all Australian soldiers were rugged bushmen, not all of them were undisciplined larrikins, not all of them were fearless, and not all of them were always good blokes. But what do you think? Do you agree that the myths we covered are actually myths? Do you have any evidence that reinforces or contests our arguments? Can you think of any myths that we didn't cover? Please feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. And as always, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope you learned something new.